I invite your attention to uh, Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6 is an interesting story that almost everybody's heard. Been done in movie theaters and it's done, been done in plays and it's been talked about in Sunday school class over and over and over and over and over and over again as Joshua at the Battle of Jericho. So we'll read, put in with the reading of Joshua chapter 6, and I'll read until I get tired. So if you can stand for that uh, in honor of the reading of God's word. Now Jericho, um, chap chapter 6 of Joshua, verse 1. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all of you, all of you, uh, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This shall you do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But on the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with a ram's horn. How I many of you know what the ram's horn is called? That's, that's all right. In, in Israel, it's called a shofar. Shofar. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with a ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, there's the bugle, that ye all the people shall shout with a great shout. Then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. That's God's word. Amen? It's a true story. Amen? Okay, you may be seated. Last Saturday morning, I was out at uh, men's Bible study out at Jeff's and uh, just sat there listening with kind of an interesting, um, I was kind of interested in what was being said. And I was kind of interesting, interested in what was being missed uh, as far as I was concerned. You know, sometimes the scripture says we know there are some things we shouldn't do because why? It's stated in there. Your mouth should not be full of profane words, okay? You should not be involved in drunkenness, okay? That's stated. So many words expressly. But the scripture also says in Isaiah, and it says again in 1 Corinthians, that we learn by concepts and precepts. A precept or a concept is just simply that we read the scripture and you read the whole verse, the whole chapter, the whole book, and you know some things are wrong and some things are right, even though it's not ever mentioned in there. For example, I want to just clue you in, folks. How many of you believe that Adam and Eve had a marriage ceremony? They didn't. But I believe they were married nonetheless. Even though it doesn't say they were, I believe they were. And, and there are many areas in Scripture where even though it doesn't say in so many words, thus, thus, and thus, the precept and the concept is there as you read the whole book. So it doesn't, you know, I hear people come up to me all the time and say, well, you said we shouldn't do such and such, and we can't do such and such. And I said, well, I never said that in the first place. Or if I did, I had a passage of Scripture to point to. But I will tell you, concepts and precepts are taught. And you know what the trouble is? The trouble is if we can't read and understand what we read, we get in trouble because we, don't, we miss them. So anyhow, that's a, that's a whole other point. Last Saturday morning we were out there discussing 1 John. Right, Paul? 1 John. And they were talking about what a wonderful passage of scripture that is and they were talking about because it always starts off first john starts off almost every it's all, all, all through first second third john my little children that's a bad translation of those words the tr the proper translation of those words is this he begins with these words my little born again ones You see, born again is a Bible term. Amen? 
And it's a Bible term found in, the, in cha John chapter 3. And John was very, very, very aware of the fact that there are some people that get into the church that aren't what? Born again. So he says, my little born again ones, he starts every one. He's saying, that's, these, that's who I'm addressing this to. My little born again ones. These are the ones that get the blessings. My little born again ones. Okay. The second thing that I thought was very interesting, and it just did, and nobody said anything about it, so I kept my mouth shut, and I thought, well, it's all right. But, er, but as I studied this passage of Scripture and studied some other Scriptures, I thought I'd got to say something about it. The church at Ephesus was a big, it was the biggest church outside of Jerusalem. The pastor of the church at Ephesus was John. When John, when John wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, he was the pastor of the church at Ephesus. The church at Ephesus had been started by the Apostle Paul. History tells us that there were as many as 10,000 members of that church. Now, the church at Jerusalem had 125,000 members, but they were on house churches. The church at Ephesus was the first church that attempted to build a building for the church. And they did, and John was the pastor. I don't know how long John was the pastor. I do know this. Now, I thought this is very interesting. When John was the pastor, and John wrote 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and it was mentioned out at, at, at Jeff's on Saturday morning what a wonderful pastor John was. This is the thing that just got me. Do you know how old John was when he was pastor of the church at Ephesus? He was in his 90s. In his early 90s, he was pastor of the church at Ephesus. I wondered, and I didn't say anything at the, at the, at the Bible study, but I just wondered to myself, how many churches we call a 90-year-old 90 pastor? You know what the answer is? None. None of them. None of them. A 90-year-old pastor. You, I'll make it even worse for you. You know what that would be in, in, in comparative years today? The average age in John's lifetime was 47 years of age the average age today is for a man is 77 if you whatever paradigm you want to use it makes him anywhere it would make him anywhere from 125 to 150 years of age comparatively speaking to today what church would call a 125 year old pastor and yet the church what while John, was, while John was pastor, the church what? Prospered. And when John was no longer the pastor, what happened to the church? You've lost your first love. Now, I know what the Scripture says. The Scripture says expressly, Paul writing to Timothy and says, don't let anybody despise your what? Your youth. Absolutely. But I wonder sometimes if maybe we've decided that we live in such a youth culture that uh, anybody over the age of 65 need not apply. We had two people come to this church to look uh, as candidates for pastor before we, we, cho we chose Andy. And I heard one comment on both of them. You know what it was? They were too old. Now, folks. I'm going to tell you something. The gospel doesn't know any age limit. And any church, I'm going to warn you, any church that decides it's going to go after one demographic is going to leave the other demographics alone, and the other demographics are not going to be there. The gospel is for how many? Everybody. I don't care whether you're 5 or 95. The gospel is for everybody. We can't, we can't go after one demographic and say that's what we got to do. We got to build the church by that one demographic and make it work. The greatest, the greatest Sundays I ever had were in the old building. 
and it was when people would come forward at the invitation and it happened over and over and over again and I would have somebody up here who was a junior high school or even a grade school or high school uh, student and I'd lead them to Christ and we'd start them in the process of baptism and I'd look up and there'd be standing in front of me an 80 or 90 year old wanting to receive Christ as well because that's what the gospel is it is for every person come me c-o-m-e children older people middle-aged and everybody and we do a great disservice to ourselves when we decide that some people are too elderly you know the two to the best churches in america today the international footprints international footprints both of them have a budget of over 80 million dollars a year and do you know what they're pastored they're both by the way they are both seeing souls saved they're seeing they're seeing missionaries sent out from their church it's a tremendous mission both of them are tremendous mission churches and both their pastors are in their mid middle 80s and I mean those people revere their pastors I mean, it's almost as bad as the Pope. And those, those pastors are in control of that church, too. They've got the vision. They run the vision. They run the whole thing, the whole shoot match. They may delegate it out, but they are, in final, they are the final authority on it all, and nobody says a word. Uh, I just wonder if that would work out here. <laughs> what do you think the answer is? Well, how, who do you suppose been thought? What, who do you suppose thought about it? Well, anyway, the reason I bring it up is because Joshua's how old here? anybody got, anybody got an idea? See, it doesn't tell you. What's the con? The precept and the concept of the scripture. How old is Joshua? Because it doesn't say in scripture. Well, I'm going to give a hundred dollars to the first person who comes close. How old? <laughs> How old is Joshua here? I'm not going to give you $100. Don't worry about it. But I mean, we're all supposed to be Bible students. We know he has to be at least how old? 40, because he went through the wilderness. Uh, he's in his 70s. He's in his 70s. Close to 80. His close buddy was Caleb, and Caleb was 80. The reason we know he has to be 40 is because he went through the wilderness. The reason we know he has to be more than 40 is he wouldn't have been sent out as a spy until he was at least 30. Because in Jewish, in Jewish culture, men were not given men's responsibilities until they reached the age of 30. So he had to be 30 on top of 40. So he had to be at least 70. You know, when I, when I, learned, this, when I learned this passage of Scripture, I learned it, how many of you may learned it on the flannel graph? You remember the flannel graphs? And they always had Joshua standing there, as a big he-man he with, you know, and he was about, oh, 25 years of age. And looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger at age 25, and he was a great, uh, great uh, warrior and all the rest. Of it. He was 70, at least 70 years old. Too old? I ask you, too old? Apparently not. Apparently not. So, as uh, that was just my, my little discussion with you about you've got to read Scripture and you've got to see the concept and you've got to see the precepts of the whole Word of God because some of it isn't spelled out for you. That's the reason why the, the Bible student needs to know geography, he needs to know history, he needs to know economics, he needs to know all those things if he's going to really rightly divide the Word of God. And if he doesn't know them, he should find a pastor and a Sunday school teacher that does. Amen? Amen. So, 
What are the three requirements in case we want to defeat our own Jericho? How many of you have ever been up against a, how many have ever been up against a wall? <laughs> and you thought, what am I going to do? I'm up against this wall. Well, God has three requirements that he speaks to us in, John, in Joshua chapter 6. Number one, we're going to have to be willing to appear foolish. Can you imagine? Can you imagine this whole scene? Here is Jericho. Jericho is a huge city. Jericho has these huge walls. These walls are thick enough for you that you can run chariot races on, on, on top of them. Now, how many of you are going to start, put yourself back in, in Joshua's time. How many of you are going to start to take over that city by going down into the wilderness and chopping down a few trees to make a battering ram so you can aim it at the doors, of the, at the gates of the city, and a catapult so you can, uh, so you can uh, throw a few rocks over there and kill a few people, and uh, I, I go out and uh, uh, make sure that every one of the men of, of valor and of war have uh, uh, two or three hatchets and an ax and all the rest of it to put somebody to death. That's the normal way to do it. And God says what? Don't do any of that. Walk around the city. See, do you think that the people of Jericho thought the Israelites were nuts? I bet they did. Here they're, they don't even have a hatchet. They don't have a battering ram. They don't have anything to do any harm to the city of Jericho, and yet they're marching around. Now, there are a lot of them. There are three million Israelis marching around the city of Jericho one time a day for six days, and then on the seventh day, seven times. And that's got to be kind of scary that there's that many people out there. And they're doing it how? They're doing it without saying a word. Later on in the, in the passage of Scripture, it says they weren't talk to each, they weren't talk to each other. <laughs> just to, they're just to walk around the city without even saying, hello, or how are you? Or yelling up at the, at the residents of Jericho and saying, your time's coming, we're about to go, we're about to get you. You've got to be willing to appear foolish. Look at verse 3 and 4. Verse 3, you shall march around the city, all you men of war, you shall go all around the city once, this, this, you, you, this you shall do six days, and seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. But on the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. And this is going to work? I, I got to tell you, I don't think I would have that much faith. The, the most impregnable city in the whole area, and the walls are going to come down because of this. Six through nine. Then Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant, let the seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city, and let him who is armed advance before the ark of the Lord. So it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests, bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns, by the way, you see the word seven over and over and over again, it's God's number, before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpets, and the, gear, and the rear guard came after the ark while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. Wow. Look at Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 27, verse 17. Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friends. They were going in tandem with each other in, in, in response to, to the leadership of the Lord, and whatever the Lord was telling him looked crazy to the rest of the world. Now, I want to say this to you, and here I want you to get, the, I want you to get this. There are some times when you're going to... <laughs> there are some times when, in order to follow God and be obedient to Him, the whole rest of the world thinks you're nuts.
I, I made it a practice many years ago when I saw people doing things that I didn't th I didn't know what they were doing. I couldn't make head nor tail of what they were doing. If I looked at them and said, what are you doing? And they looked at me and said, I'm trying to be obedient to God. I, I left it alone. Now, look, you can't be obedient to God and be violating his word. You understand that? But if they weren't violating his word in any way, shape, or form, and they were being obedient to God, I let them alone because God, God knows what he's doing. And being obedient to God is not going to make sense to the world at all. Forget that. The world will never understand it. Unfortunately, the people in the church don't either. When, uh, when Mike left here, oh, there were a lot of people upset when Mike left. And some people asked me, and I said, he was just being obedient. What do you want him to be? God told him to leave. You either trust that or you don't. I think I know why God told him to leave. I don't know whether I know or not, but I think I do. But it doesn't matter. God told him to leave. I don't want, listen, if somebody tells somebody to leave, I don't want them staying. Because they got, they got no blessing here, and there's no blessing to anybody else here if they're walking in disobedience. The only thing you and I can do for God is, Two things, is we can be faithful to him and we can be obedient to him. That's it. The rest of it, we can't do anything about it. We can be faithful and we can be obedient. We have those things under our control. You don't know about sin. Sin can ambush you every once in a while. And you, don't, you, you, you just didn't, weren't aware of the fact that it was coming at you. But obedience is what's the scripture say again obedience is better than sacrifice and to hearken that is to listen to the voice of god is better than the fat of rams he'd rather have you listen than sacrifice to him and being obedient to him and being faithful to him is the only two things he asks us to do and the only two things we have control over we, listen, we have control of whether we're going to be faithful in God's house. We have control of whether we're going to be faithful in God's tithe. We have control over, over whether we're going to be faithful in our prayer life and all the rest of it. And we have control of whether we're going to be obedient to his word. And again, you must be willing to look stupid to a lot of other people. Number two, you must trust in the Lord's power. Look at verse 12. And Joshua rose up early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. Then the seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew with the trumpets, and the armed men went before them, and the rear guard came up after the ark of the Lord while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. So they did so for six days. They had to depend upon God's power. How many of you would have quit after the first day? <laughs> I know all you supercilious saints wouldn't have, because because you're just you're just really on top of things. Listen, most people would have quit after the first day. The second day, are you kidding me? The third day, nothing's happened. The fourth day, nothing's happened. The fifth day, nothing's happened. The sixth day, nothing's happened. I, they had to trust what? They had to trust God. God said it wasn't going to happen on the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, or sixth day. He said it's going to happen on the what? The seventh day. They had to trust. They had to trust for a whole week. Hmm. Psalm. Look at the Psalm. Verse, chapter 5, verse 1. Fifth division of the Psalms. Verse 3, my voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. I want to know what God wants me to do tomorrow. Do you? Hello. Do you want to know what God wants you to do tomorrow? Do you believe he has a plan for you tomorrow? How many have already, how many have already planned your day tomorrow? God has a plan. He has a plan every day for his children. And we must trust in his power. 
And we must trust in his power. And so that's what they did. Now, if we're going to have, if we're going to fight the battle of Jericho, if we're going to, if we're going to knock down the walls that are in front of us that keep that impede us from progress, then number one, we're going to have to, we're going to have to look. I'm sorry, but we're just going to have to look crazy to the world, and probably crazy to most of the church, members of the church. And secondly, we're going to have to trust in His power and His power alone. What power did they have? Blowing a horn, whoopee. That's going to knock. That's going to knock down a, a, a wall. They blow a horn. I hope you don't think that happens. That's not normal. Zechariah four six. May I say to you, we must never forget Zechariah four six. In case you don't know where Zechariah is, and it's in the Old Testament, but this is what it says: Not by might, nor by power. But by my spirit, saith the Lord. Now, church that doesn't want to talk about the Holy Spirit is a church that's lost. Because nothing is going to happen in the church on the power of the preacher in the pulpit or the power of the church board or the power of the elders. Nothing's going to happen on that power alone. It's going to be on the power of the Holy Spirit being unleashed in the church. And we're going to, listen, we can't just assume that it is. We have to pray. What's the scripture say in Ephesians chapter 4? We have to pray that we will be refreshed and renewed by that spirit. How often? Every single day and many times a day because that spirit is under attack attack by our bodies and it's under attack by this world over and over and over again and when he says to us, he says don't be drunk with wine wherein is excess but be ye filled and this, again I'm going to give you some, some context in the original Greek it is it is at the context of continually being filled it's just it's like you like you get filled up with gasoline in your car and you go a block and what do you you don't have to buy another block when you go a block you don't have to buy another tank of gas do you unless you got a real bad car but when you walk another block in this world you better call for the spirit to refresh you on the next block and the next block and the next block he must be a con and notice i said he because that's what scripture calls him not it and not she he, the Holy Spirit, must be a constant companion, and we must ask for him and his leadership daily, daily, and many times during the day. Then number three, expect your faith to grow. Expect your faith to grow. I read to you now verses 21 through the rest of the chapter. Verse 21, and they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and woman, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey with the edge of the sword. But Joshua had said to the two men who had, used, who had spied out the country, go into Rahab's house and from there bring out the woman and all that she has as you swore to her. And the young men who had, seen, who had been spies went in and brought out Rahab, her father, her mother, her brothers, and all that she had. So they brought out all her relatives and left them outside the camp of Israel. But they burned the city and all that was in it with fire. Only the silver and gold and the vessels of bronze and iron they put into the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua spared Rahab, the harlot, her father's household, and all that she had. So she dwells in the Israel to this day because she had hid the messengers whom Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. Not only did she dwell in Israel, but she could, she's, in the, she's in the lineage of Jesus. And all that says to us, we must expect our faith to grow. Rahab had faith, and her faith was that the men of Israel and the God of Israel was going to deliver Jericho into Israel's hands. And because she had faith, her faith grew, and eventually she's in the line of, Je of the Lord Jesus himself, even though she's a woman of questionable <laughs> re reputation. Well, is that, you know, that makes me feel good. 
because as far as God's concerned, I'm in a line of questionable reputation. God can forgive, and God does forgive. I want to call your attention, and then we'll finish. James, go to the Old Te uh, New Testament, over to the book of James. Chapter 1. And we'll just read starting at verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives liberally to all and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for one who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. And let, that man, let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man and unstable in all his ways. What he's saying to us is these Jerichos, these walls are put in front of us for our are you ready for it? For our good to grow spiritually. Now, I don't want to grow that much. I'll be quite honest with you. I'd like for, I'd like for my life to be just as simple and uncompli uncomplicated as could be. And I probably wouldn't amount to a hill of beans. God puts walls in front of every last one of us, and he expects us to have the faith he expects us to do the work of, of obedience and faithfulness to overcome the walls and walk on where he wants us to walk. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word. We always do, Lord. It's our only hope. And we ask, dear Father, that you might take what's said, said tonight and burn it into our hearts and let us, let us not forget it. Now, give traveling mercies to these people on their way home in this inclement weather. Bless them with safety. And dear Father, we ask for your blessing to be upon them. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his throne. To him, the Lord Jesus, be all power, dominion, and glory forever and ever, even so. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you for your attendance. And thank you for your attention.